All right, everyone, good morning. We're going to begin our time together as we have the last few weeks. We're going to do the public reading of Scripture. It's something we want to continue to dedicate ourselves to because we believe it's important for our church family, our community, and the growth of our faith. If you would, please repeat after me. Say these words. Say, Jesus, I want what you want for me today. Say, Jesus, I need what you have for me today. I invite you, if you want to, open with me to Ephesians chapter 1. We were there last week. We're going to continue reading in Ephesians here. Paul has some powerful words for us, some encouragement for the church. And we're going to begin in verse 15, chapter 1, verse 15. You're welcome to follow along if you'd like. This is the public reading of Scripture, and these are the very words of God. Ever since I first heard of your strong faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for God's people everywhere, I have not stopped thanking God for you. I pray for you constantly, asking God, the glorious Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, to give you spiritual wisdom and insight so that you might grow in the knowledge of God. I pray that your hearts will be flooded with light so that you can understand the confident hope that he has given to those he called, his holy people, who are his rich and glorious inheritance. That's us. I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe in him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. Now he is far above any ruler or authority or power or leader or anything else, not only in this world, but also in the world to come. God has put all things under the authority of Christ and has made him head over all things for the benefit of the church. And the church is his body. It is made full and complete by Christ who fills all things everywhere with himself. And these are the very words of God. Lord Jesus, we bless you today. We thank you for loving us, for giving us these words of encouragement. Lord, let us dwell in your power. Let us lean on you and you alone. Lord, I love this. Above any rule or authority, power, any systems of man, you are in control. Jesus, it's you. I want to invite you just to give them some thanks this morning to Jesus, thanking him for his, his blessing the church, thanking him for this family. Take just a minute and lift those up to him. Father, we praise you, we bless you, and we ask these things in your name, in Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. amen. Hey, let's stand and worship the Lord this morning. I'll raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I'll raise a hallelujah. is the 
raise a hallelujah. darkness flee I'll raise a hallelujah in the middle of the mystery I'll raise a hallelujah oh fears you lost your hold on servants of the Lord, you who serve at night in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands towards the sanctuary and praise the Lord. Raise your voice. Shout a hallelujah. Let's continue worshiping our mighty God. All right, sing us together. King of every heartbeat Ruler of our history, sovereign over everything, through every age, author of salvation, a hope of every nation, high above the heavens be enthroned on our praise. You are a mighty God, you 
are a mighty God. Angels bow before you. Heaven and earth adore you. You are a mighty God. You are a mighty God. Crowned in all your glory. Only you are holy. shame yes you are came to rescue all the lost a victor of the rugged cross roll the stone away for us conquer the grave you are a mighty god you are a mighty god angels bow before you heaven and earth adore you you are a mighty god skies rejoice let the oceans roar we will lift our voice singing holy let the whole world see of your majesty you're the only king who is old let the sky let the skies rejoice let the ocean Worship a mighty God, amen. Amen. We're going to continue to worship this morning and ask the ushers to come forward to collect the morning offerings.
this is all my hope and peace it's nothing but the blood of jesus this is all my righteousness nothing but the blood of jesus Father, we thank you for sending your son Jesus to shed his blood so that we could be made whole with you again and that that tear and that relationship could be repaired. There's no other way to have a relationship with you than other than through Jesus, through his shed blood on the cross for us. So God, we praise you this day for his blood. We praise you for his forgiveness. We praise you for his grace. We praise you for his example here on earth that we may know what it looks like to live a kingdom, a different reality here now. It doesn't just save us one day when we pass away from this earth, but right now. Life is different now. So Jesus, we thank you. Help us to live into this reality. We bless you. And all God's people said, amen. You guys may be seated. All right, good morning. I've got to be careful and clip my beard in that clip. It pinches, it pulls. <sighs> Jesus, thank you for these offerings. We see these as seed gifts, things to grow and expand your kingdom, maybe even in places that haven't even been mentioned or thought of yet. Lord, give your people in leadership creativity to imagine where the kingdom can still go how the kingdom can still be imagined and lived out. So we thank you, we bless you, in your name, amen. amen. I am not even sure where to start here. Not sure if you came by and saw my spread this morning. I have potatoes, I have avocados, I have a squash, carrots, onion, cabbage, not lettuce, cabbage, but I think I am actually going to get a banana first. I'm going to eat a banana. That's okay. You guys don't mind, do you? No. Whatever. You're here anyway. I got you. <laughs> so, you know what? This seems like it's too much for me to enjoy by myself. Ian, you want to have a bite, buddy? Come on up here. Elijah, you're a high school teenage boy. Come on up here real quick. Come on. I got a chair for you at the table. Here, sit down. Go ahead. Ian, okay. Where? What'd you get? Banana. You took a banana, too? I did. All right. Amanda, put bananas on our shopping list. We're going to run low. What do you want? Banana. You want? Jeez yeah. Louise. Okay. Another banana. Rip it off there. Thank you. You're welcome. I do have green olives. If you want green olives. No tart? Okay. What did you have for breakfast before you came? A uh, Pop-Tart. A Pop-Tart? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I got to at least ask what kind of Pop-Tart? Strawberry. Okay. Uh, you're forgiven. Okay. If I ever get a Pop-Tart, it's got to be a strawberry. I don't do the s'mores or chocolate. What'd you have? <laughs> Mouthful. <laughs> breakfast. I know. This is my breakfast so far. I didn't get a chance to eat this morning. Well, you're welcome. There you go. Thank you. 
you know what? I'm going to finish this a little bit. I'm going to get a piece of bread. Who else likes bread? Okay, we're Americans. Who all wants a piece of bread? Darren, here, tear a piece off. Go ahead. Doug, a piece of bread? Sure, okay. Got a little baguette here. It's pretty good. Now, I don't have the right mix for it now, but sometimes we'll take like olive oil and some salt and we'll, you guys do that at home? Then you take your bread and you dip it. Kind of makes you feel fancy. Okay, we do that. I'm going to take a bite of this now, if you guys don't mind. This is good. I need a drink. I should have had a thing of coffee for you guys. I apologize. That's good. All right. No? Do you guys like that banana? It's very good. How would you describe it? Like a normal banana. Like a normal <laughs> banana. I guess I walked into that when you guys raised him well. Well, there you go. Well, I appreciate you guys helping out. I hope you enjoy the food. You guys can find a seat if you like. Hey, if you would, repeat after me. Say these words. Say, taste and see, taste and see that, the Lord is good. that the Lord is good. These are the very words of God. I am curious. If I was to ask you, what is one of your most memorable meals, what would you say? If we sat down together and I said, hey, what's a meal that you've had that sticks out into your mind that, that's significant, what would it be? I, I don't want to add any qualifiers to that because I want to give you the freedom to imagine whatever comes to your mind. But I hope you're thinking of it because in just a moment, I'm going to ask you to share it with someone around you. So think about it. In the meantime, uh, to give you some time to process and think what yours would be, I, I'll share with you mine. I'll, I'll tell you what one of my most memorable meals is. It's been years ago now at this point, but it happened to be on a Thanksgiving dinner. And Amanda and I, we weren't married yet, but we got to the point where all serious couples do, right? Where hey, let's have our families meet together. Okay, your parents meet my parents. And for us, it just happened to be over Thanksgiving dinner. And what made this meal extra special in my mind was it wasn't just my parents meeting her parents for the first time, but it was Amanda's grandparents. It was her aunts. It was her brother. It was really these my world and her world coming together. It was sort of the beginning of this this new family, and it made it extra special. Now, the turkey, Randy does a deep-fried turkey. It's so good. The corn, the stuffing, the mashed potatoes, the noodles, the pumpkin pie, it was all just extra good that day for whatever reason. But what made it special was these two worlds coming together. Looking back now, that meal has taken on even more significance for me because a lot of those people who were gathered around the table that day They've now passed. They are no longer with us. They passed away and they physically can't celebrate with their family anymore for holiday meals. That meal many years ago established this memory that is still cherished every Thanksgiving meal that we get together. We almost relive these moments. It was one of my favorite dinners. What about you? What is one of your most memorable meals? I'm going to ask that you turn to family nearby or a friend sitting close to you, and I'm going to give you a couple minutes. We're going to have some fun this morning. I want you to think about this. Spend some time sharing what is one of your most memorable meals and describe it. And if you're watching on live stream, I encourage you to turn to someone in your house or give someone a call. Let them know. So I'll pull us back together here in a couple minutes, but share. Share your memories of your most memorable meal. Go ahead.
All right, I'm going to pull us back together here. Did you listen to the stories? Did you hear the hearts of the people who were sharing those, those memories? Our most memorable meals often reveal less about our culinary preferences and more about our deepest longings in our value. How many of your stories had family involved in them somewhere? How many of them had maybe a funny story or a way you grew or something that you've, you've experienced, not just partook in, but experienced? Something special happens whenever we gather around food. It's a place where many of us experience authentic community. Maybe at work, maybe at school, maybe some activity you do, you feel alone. You feel like an outsider, like you don't belong. But when you come home and eat at the table, you experience true community. It's a time where we're often vulnerable with one another. We might say things at the table that we wouldn't in public or just passing. Stories are often given a place in our family history around the dinner table. You can guarantee that there's love and reconciliation with someone maybe sitting beside you or across from you. Laughter may fill your dining rooms as you wait in anticipation for the punchline of the joke. Or maybe it's the opposite, and you just sit with somebody as a tear comes down their cheek as they recall a painful experience or a circumstance that they're going through. Something powerful happens when we gather around food. It's a means for experiencing transformation. And this is definitely true in the biblical narrative as well. Today I want to give more of a, more of a teaching in an experience than maybe a traditional sermon that you came this morning expecting. And right off the bat, I want to give credit to Margaret Feinberg. If you get a chance to read this book, it is fantastic. She has really challenged the way that I think and, and live food. We can, we can go that far. Our goals today are two things. Number one, I want you to leave here more hungry. I want you to leave here loving food more. And the second is this. If you leave challenged to see Jesus in reconciliation through food, then we can depart having taken a step closer towards being hungrier disciples for Jesus. That's it. Let's be hungrier disciples for Jesus. I want you to love food more too. This is where we're going to head. Let, let me say a quick prayer for us again. Father, today may be different for us, not just in what we're doing, but how we think about something that we encounter on a daily basis. Help us to be creative. Help us to have imagination. We love you. We bless you. Amen. Hey, let's follow this theme of food in the Bible for, for just a minute. I want to see where it all takes place. And the best place to start is all the way back in Genesis. So let's go to the beginning. The creation narrative in Genesis opens up like a feast. There are fruits. There are vegetables. There are seed-bearing plants. There are trees and bushes. There are things everywhere to eat. Less than a thousand words into the Bible, and God has already created every ingredient needed for an epic meal. So the Lord takes the next logical step, and he creates somebody, Adam and Eve, to eat the fruits and vegetables of his delicious bounty, to enjoy the taste, to enjoy the textures, to enjoy the flavor and even the smells. It is an Eden that God really consecrates the first farm-to-table dining experience. We think it's this new culinary uh, definition style of eating, farm-to-table, it's so fresh. Jesus is doing it here. The Father is doing it all the way back in Genesis in Eden. But the sweetness of the story comes to a crashing halt with a bite of fruit of all things. Adam and Eve are removed from the garden buffet. And as we will soon see, food will continue to play a significant role in helping us taste and see the goodness of God in our lives. Say this with me. Say, taste and see, taste and see. That, the good, that the Lord is good. For the remainder of Genesis, the primary example, the primary use or vehicle of God's blessing is, you guessed it, it's food. God uses Noah to preserve food in the ark 
and he establishes his covenant with Abraham over a meaty offering. Abraham's wife, Sarah, bakes up bread cakes for angelic visitors, and their son, Isaac, breathes a sigh of relief when roasted lamb appears on the menu instead of himself as a substitute offering. Later, Esau trades his blessing for lentil soup. And Jacob tricks his father into giving him a blessing through goat stew. When famine threatens the globe, Joseph blesses all who come to them by, by feeding them. It is in this act that he foreshadows a day when the Son of God will bless all who come to him by feeding them the bread of life. And his name is Jesus. The story continues with Moses and his sidekick brother Aaron, whose staff produces miracles and what? Wild almonds. When they face off with Pharaoh, the ten plagues reverse the Genesis creation order, and it decimates the food sources of Egypt. The poultry, the livestock, the fish, the fruits, the vegetables, even the water. This account, the Exodus, is memorialized through a meal of sacred remembrance, roasted lamb, bitter herbs, and flatbread. Now leaving Egypt and traveling the wilderness, the Hebrews recall the day of, of all we had Pots full of food in our homes in Egypt. If only we could go back to Egypt. And God listens. God hears their cries. He provides for them a substance called manna, a sweet wafer that tastes like honey. The literal definition of manna is, what is this? What is it called? But as we know, man cannot live by bread alone. He hears their groanings and their crying out. So he rains down quail on the people. The book of Numbers says the poultry reached a yard high as far as one man could walk in a single day. To translate this <laughs> into classic Forrest Gump terms, you can barbecue it, you can broil it, you can boil it, you can bake it, you can saute it. There are quail kebabs, quail creole, quail gumbo, pan fried, deep fried, stir fried. Quail is everywhere, and we've only just begun to look at food in the biblical narrative. We might even say that God is the first foodie. There is food at every turn reminding us that God provides for us food, not just for our physical sustainment, but something more. Food becomes a doorway to the divine and a gateway for transformation. Have you ever thought about food in that way before? When we sit down at breakfast, lunch, and dinner, when you pick up a snack, maybe, <laughs> maybe your second snack of the day or your third snack of the day, do you see that moment as a time when you encounter God, His divine provision? Through food, the Israelites will break free from their unhealthy upbringing. It's through food that the Israelites will grow in their dependence on and their trust in God. It's through food that the Israelites will experience God's goodness together as a community. And it's through food that the Israelites will learn of new ways to think about and to talk about God. Jesus does this too, right? He says, I am the bread of life. He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He even says, I am living water. Jesus does this too. The story of the Israelites, it challenges us to be expectant of God to do the same things in our life whenever we gather around the table. When we feed our physical appetites in community, we open our hearts for God to feed something deeper in us as well. I want to start to narrow our focus here a little bit this morning, and we're going to head over to the Gospel of Luke. I, I invite you to turn there with me now to the Gospel of Luke. Many of Luke's most powerful moments happen with Jesus around the table or when food is present. There's a banquet at Levi's house in chapter 5. There's dinner at Simeon's home whenever an immoral woman hears that Jesus is eating there and she shows up uninvited. The feeding of the 5,000 on the way to Bethsaida. 
hospitality in the home of Mary and Martha, where Martha is working to prepare this big dinner. There's a meal in a Pharisee's house upon invitation. Sabbath meal at a leader's dwelling. The Last Supper where Jesus inaugurates the new covenant. There's the breaking of bread with the two men on the way to Emmaus. There's Jesus eating broiled fish with his disciples before he returns to the Father in heaven. But maybe my favorite food story in all of Luke comes in chapter 19 with Zacchaeus of all characters. If you would please turn in your text with me to Luke 19 verses 1 through 10. Jesus is slowly making his way to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover dinner with his disciples for the last time. If we were to ask Jesus this morning, what is maybe your most memorable meal? It, it might be the last Passover he had with his disciples. Along the way, Jesus is turning the status quo on its head. He's healing blind beggars. He's blessing children. He's getting near to people who have leprosy. And he's connecting with folks that many have avoided. As we said last week, Jesus is noticing others. All of this is happening. When we get to chapter 19, the story is no different. The pattern's not broken here. We are going to see Jesus encounter a man, an outsider who desperately wants to catch a glimpse of Jesus as he walks by. So let's go with him to Jericho and meet Zacchaeus for ourselves. Starting in verse 1. Jesus entered Jericho and made his way through the town. There was a man there named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector in the region, and he had become very rich. He tried to get a look at Jesus, but he was too short. He was too short to see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and he climbed a sycamore fig tree beside the road for Jesus as he was going to pass that way. When Jesus came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus and he called him by name. Zacchaeus! He said, quick, come down. I must be a guest in your home today. Zacchaeus quickly climbed down and took Jesus to his house in great excitement and joy. But the people were displeased. He has gone to be the guest of a notorious sinner, they grumbled. Meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and he said, I will give half my wealth to the poor, Lord, and if I have cheated people on their taxes, I will give them back four times as much. And Jesus responded, Salvation has come to this home today. For this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and save those who were lost. In our story this morning, Jesus enters Jericho and he's walking through the town. Jericho from the outside looks like a great place to be. It has a natural water source. There are springs that feed its crops and vegetation. So there's life that can happen here. A lot of the cities and towns that surround Jericho are not this plentiful. In fact, in the Old Testament, we often refer to Jericho as the city of palms. But not everything is as it seems in Jericho. There, there are problems. There are issues we still deal with. It's a place that could be rough for the average person to live during the time of Jesus. It's a town full of rebels. It's a town full of zealots, revolutionaries, people who want to see the kingdom of God come, and they're willing to take it by force. Perhaps the same crowd of the two gentlemen we referenced last week who hang beside Jesus on the cross, revolutionaries. This is a rough town. Only the toughest of cats could live here. Neighboring areas will look at Jericho with suspicion and caution. Because of this, we expect to encounter people here who leave this unfavorable taste in our mouths. And yes, it's also true of Zacchaeus, a tax collector. We're told that Zacchaeus is a chief tax collector, which means he stands on top of the collection pyramid. He takes his cut of the commission, taxing people above and beyond the normal rates. 
if the governing authorities say, Zacchaeus, we need $100 a person, and Zacchaeus charges $125, well, he'll siphon off that $25 and give the $100. As long as the government is getting their fair share, Zacchaeus is willing and able to take anything above and beyond, and he does. He's not exactly the kind of guy that you want to be hanging out with. He's a chief tax collector, he's living in Jericho, and now he's trying to work his way to the front of a line to see Jesus. You might be asking yourself, well, what does this have to do with food? Where is reconciliation taking place that we mentioned earlier? All we see is a rich guy that nobody likes, living in a place of suspicion and danger, trying to sneak a glimpse of Jesus. When is food going to show up? But listen to how the story continues. Notice this unique detail that tells us that Zacchaeus is too short to see Jesus. And I seriously doubt that the crowds are going to let someone they dislike up to the front of the line. You guys know what I'm talking about, right? We go to the grocery store, we hop in line, that's our spot. We go to an amusement park and we wait in line for a roller coaster, that's our spot. We don't like it when someone cuts in front of us. Imagine if it's someone you dislike. They're probably not going to get to the front of a line. But being resourceful, Zacchaeus runs ahead and he climbs what? A sycamore fig tree beside the road. This tree has a short trunk with wide lateral branches, making it super easy for climbing. And up goes Zacchaeus. And this is where the story really starts to get good. The Hebrew name for a sycamore fig tree is Shikama. Can you say Shikama? shikama. Say it again, shikama. shikama. It's a word whose root means rehabilitation. And that's exactly what happens in this story. Zacchaeus doesn't force his way up into just any tree. He doesn't climb a palm that is likely there in Jericho. No, he climbs a rehabilitation tree, a sycamore fig. Did you ever imagine or think a simple fruit, a fig, could be a symbol of someone's rehabilitation, their desire to get better? I don't believe that this happens by accident. And it's here that we see food starting to reveal reconciliation. Jesus sees him in a fig tree and he calls out, Zacchaeus! Zach, come down. You gotta, I've got to be a guest in your home today. Zacchaeus, you got to get down. And he calls him by name. So he climbs down from his safe observation post in the rehabilitation tree and into a whole new life, soon healed by Jesus and his love. Onlookers may be expected now because they see where Zacchaeus is. There's a possibility that rehabilitation's on its way, tipped off by the figs that may be growing right next to Zacchaeus. Everything from this point, beginning in a fig tree, will reveal the rehabilitation of Zacchaeus, ultimately leading to his salvation. And it's here I would like us to take a look at three things that are going to follow. I believe that this rehabilitation towards salvation holds three familiar truths for us as well. So let's take a look at three things. The first is this. Zacchaeus begins his rehabilitation towards salvation by moving to action and climbing down at the command of Jesus. Jesus has something for him. Jesus has something specific for Zacchaeus. He says, I must be a guest in your home today. He doesn't say when you have time, when you're free, is it possible? Jesus calls him by name, looks up in the fig tree and says, Zacchaeus, I must be a guest in your home today. What a surprise this must have been for Zacchaeus. All he wanted was a glimpse of Jesus as he walks by. And now the man himself is asking to be a guest in his home. This is incredible. So he gets down quickly and leads Jesus to his place in great excitement and joy. And I love, I love the enthusiasm of Jesus here. He sees him, he calls him out, and he tells him exactly what he wants. 
we get the sense that Jesus has something more for Zacchaeus than just a simple visit. This straightforward self-invitation will be the beginning of something bigger than just a casual visit, a game of Scrabble or a snack of fish and loaves. Jesus has something for him. Jesus has something more for you, too. It's salvation offered freely to all who believe, who confess and turn your life to him. So many people settle for just trying to catch a glimpse of Jesus as he walks by. Imagine if followers of Jesus were satisfied enough to stay up in the tree, never coming down at the sound of his invitation. You would miss out on something huge. He's got something for you. Don't settle. There's more. Get out of your rehabilitation tree and respond with excitement and joy. I firmly believe that sometimes in our lives or even in our walks with Jesus, we expect so little. I think of the quote by by C.S. Lewis, I think it is, who says, we are like children who sit in the gutters satisfied with mud pies when the Father has prepared a feast for us. We expect so little. We don't anticipate the supernatural. We tamp down what God can do out of fear of disappointment. I don't know if I can deal with it if he doesn't show up. I don't know if I can deal with it if this specific thing doesn't happen. Some here today are stuck in a fig tree. You're not coming down because you're settling for just a glimpse of Jesus as he passes by. But he's got something for you. If you believe that, then take a step down in obedience by getting out of the tree and see what's next. Jesus wants to come to your home today. The second thing I like us to notice in the story of Zacchaeus is that rehabilitation is for everyone. Jesus eats and spends time with sinners. Now, notice the reaction of the crowds when Jesus invites himself to Zacchaeus' home. They were displeased, and they said, he has gone to be the guest of a notorious sinner, and they grumble. Can you believe this Jesus eating with those guys over there? That's ridiculous. They're upset. What kind of reaction is this? Now, the meaning of notorious sinner here is absolute moral failure, someone who violates God's law. These are incredibly harsh words. You don't just say these things on a whim or casually without revealing something deeper that's taking place within your heart. But it shouldn't surprise us, right? These are the same people that squeezed Zacchaeus out of the crowds to begin with, and forced him up in the tree. They're the reason he had to run ahead just so he could see what was going on. They already think poorly of him, whether they're right or wrong. The crowds believe Zacchaeus is beyond rehabilitation. He's a sinner that's deserving of God's wrath because he's an absolute moral failure. What they do not understand, though, is that Jesus desires the rehabilitation of everyone even the notorious failures in the eyes of the world. Zacchaeus, he, he probably knows that everybody hates him. He knows he doesn't quite fit in in this community well. Collecting taxes above and beyond the standard really wouldn't win many fans today either, would it? Here's Zacchaeus. I'm guessing he's alone. doesn't have a ton of friends to call up, really nowhere to necessarily belong or call his place. He's desperately in need of rehabilitation and a new beginning. And his life starts to change when Jesus invites himself over. Jesus doesn't shy away from outsiders. In fact, Jesus loves to eat and to spend time with those just as he does here with Zacchaeus. In the Gospel of Mark, we discover Jesus eating at Levi's house, also around food. Another meal is happening. And many sinners and tax collectors begin showing up only for the Pharisees to have a very similar reaction. They don't know why Jesus is choosing these guests. 
Jesus, your, your choice and guest is, is pretty poor. Or later in the Gospel of Luke, after this account, it tells us that Jesus welcomes people, sinners and the outcast. We could go on and on with the examples of, of who Jesus hangs out with, but let's remember this. If we believe that food provides a doorway to the divine and that reconciliation can happen around a dinner table, then it shouldn't surprise us when Jesus throws out invitations to even sinners, to disreputable. Some questions for us to consider when we think about this. What kinds of people are you hanging out with? If you look back over the last couple of days, weeks, months, what kind of folks are you hanging out with? Who would you invite to dinner with your family? Do they look more like you? Or do they look more like Zacchaeus? Now, I realize this question may look different now because of the situation we're in. You might not be comfortable inviting people over, and I get that, 100% totally understand. But seriously, who's on your dinner guest list? Who would you invite over? If we want to see transformation in our community and the rehabilitation of the most desperate around us, then invite them to dinner. Invite somebody over for a meal or be a guest in their home and show up and let Jesus do his thing. Often we just have to be present and notice what Jesus is doing and join in. It's not that hard. Invite someone to dinner. Go to dinner at someone else's home. I love this quote here from Rick McKinley. He says this, so good. I believe that what gives followers of Jesus distinction from the world is the subversive way that we do the ordinary things in life. We can better put on display his kingdom more powerfully by finding the right candidate to invite to dinner. That may sound like nonsense to us, but for some reason, it didn't to Jesus. My challenge for you this week is to invite Zacchaeus over for dinner. If you're not comfortable or you're able to because of health restrictions, then, then how about making a casserole? How about making something in the crock pot and sending it over to someone's house who could really use it? Jesus transforms lives over a simple meal. He eats and spends time with sinners. But what about you? The last thing we notice from the story of Zacchaeus and perhaps the most encouraging, at least for me, is that Zacchaeus responds to his breakthrough accordingly, right? Zacchaeus has a breakthrough, and he responds accordingly. Standing before Jesus, he begins to offer up his wealth to reverse the things that he's done wrong by overtaxing folks. J J Jesus, I, I'm so glad you're here today. Thank you for coming. You know what? I'm going to make this right. I see this isn't the way I'm supposed to be living. I'm going to give back double what I've overtaxed. No, no, no. I'm going to give triple. No, wait. I'm going to give back four times what I've overtaxed people. And Jesus says this. Salvation has come to this home today. The money isn't just about money, but it reveals something that's happening within Zacchaeus' heart. Salvation has come to this home today, for he has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save all who are lost. Salvation did come to Zacchaeus' home that day. And his name is Jesus. And Zacchaeus experienced salvation because he sought rehabilitation. And he responded with obedience. He accepted Jesus' invitation and he invited him into his home. And it all started in a fig tree. It all begins with food. Let's return there this morning. Let's go back to food where we, where we began our time together. Meal times become sacred spaces of supernatural satisfaction. Not necessarily because the steak is grilled perfectly or the side dishes complement the main meal or lead us right into the dessert. 
But it's because the dinner table is a place to know and to be known, to understand and to be understood, to love and to be loved. In community, God touches our physical appetites and our spiritual hungers. Every table is a doorway. It's an entrance into a holy and sacred communion with God and with those around us. Food is a time for us to experience God's creative and his redemptive touch. Honestly, and I, and I mean this, every mealtime is an opportunity to be on the lookout for how Christ will reveal himself in surprising ways. Margaret Feinberg, who we referenced her book earlier, she says this, Food is God's love made delicious, nutritious, and restorative. We must learn to slow down and to savor the delicate flavors and divine lessons. In a culture that's overrun with consumerism and driven by efficiency, where many meals are handed out of a drive through window and eaten solo, this isn't the easiest spiritual discipline to practice, but it is well worth it. Look for God's restorative works in food. My prayer for us today is that, that as you set your table, you do so not just with food, but you do it with vulnerability and delight. May your mouth be filled not just with bites of meat, fruits, vegetables, but with reminders of God's loving kindness. When you walk through the grocery store, remember that your story began in a garden. And remember that as we gather around the communion table, we receive salvation through Jesus Christ. And to all of my forward-thinking friends, those of you who like to plan and think ahead, don't forget that every meal at which you find yourself, let it be a foretaste of the feast to come when we will dine with Jesus in eternity. Repeat after me, say these words, taste and see, taste and see. That, the that the Lord is good. These are the very words of God. Let's pray. Father, give us a hunger today for the bread of life. Give us a thirst for living water. At our meal times, Lord, would you allow us to see your goodness in every bite, the sweet, the savory, but even the bitter. We worship you for your creative bounty, first in the garden and now even in our homes. Don't let us take another bite, Lord, without thinking about you, your salvation, your restoration, maybe even the rehabilitation on its way, just like it was for Zacchaeus. We bless you, we worship you, we lift these things up in your name, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you would please stand and let's worship together. Let's taste and see. Oh, 
specifically this week that you put a Zacchaeus in our path that we may extend your fig of rehabilitation of restoration and salvation it's time to invite others to the table it's time to be a part of your good works we pray these things in your blessed name in Jesus name amen